Continuation of the impeachment trial of the Honorable Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Renato C. Corona, is here by call to order. We shall be led in prayer by Senator Francis G. Escudero. Thank you, Mr. President. Panginoon, sa muli po ninyong pagpapahiram sa amin ang panibagong buhay at lakas sa araw na ito, tanggapin po sana ninyo ang aming pagpapasalamat at pagkilala sa inyong biyaya. Sa muli po namin pagditipon ngayon, ikaw po sana ang aming maging gabay at panuntunan. May you grant us the spirit of fairness, right thought, and speech. Teach us to look at, weigh, and appreciate different perspectives based on truth and reason. Please impart your supreme wisdom among all of us and guide us to make the best use of our own. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the Secretary will please call the roll, okay. Senators. The Honorable Senator Judges Angara Arroyo, Cayetano Allen Peter Campanero, Cayetano Pia, Defensor Santiago, Drilon Ejercito Estrada Escudero Gingona, Honasan Laxon Lapid Legarda, Marcos Osmeña. Reading of the March 15, 2012 Journal of the Senate sitting as an impeachment court and consider the same as approved. Is there any objection? Hearing none. The March 15, 2012 Journal of the Senate, sitting as an impeachment court, is here by group. Uh, please, uh, the Secretary will now please call the case. Case number 0022011 in the matter of impeachment trial of Honorable Chief Justice Renato C. Corona. Appearances, uh, Majority Floor Leader. May we ask the uh, parties for their, uh, or to enter their appearances, Mr. President? Prosecution. Good afternoon, Mr. President. For the prosecution panel of the House of Representatives, same appearances. We are ready, Your Honor. Noted. Defense. Good afternoon, Mr. President and members of the uh, impeachment court. Uh, for the defense, Your Honor, uh, same appearance. Noted. Just Mr. President. Leader. Mr. President, <clears throat> for a manifestation, may we recognize Senator Miriam Defensor Santiago. The lady senator from Iloilo is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. It appears to me that we have come to the point in this impeachment trial when we are faced with the centerpiece of the prosecution, meaning to say the accusation against the filing of the son statement of assets, liabilities, and net worth by the Chief Justice. It appears to be the showpiece of the prosecution, and therefore we must take time, not only take time out of number crunching, which you were doing last week, and see what the Constitution and what the Supreme Court have said about the filing of the son. First, let me begin with Article 2 of the Articles of Impeachment. I will read it verbatim. Respondent committed culpable violation of the Constitution and or betrayed the public trust when he failed to disclose, I repeat, when he failed to disclose to the public his statement of assets, liabilities, and net worth as required under Section 17, Article 11 of the 1987 Constitution. Notice that this heading under the Articles of Impeachment only uses the phrase failed to disclose. If we had disclosed and we were we are going to apply this article literally and very strictly, then there is no more case because it turns out now that he, fa he disclosed his statement of assets and liabilities as provided by law, as I shall explain later. So in my view, Article 2 is suffering from at least incompetence in phraseology because if we were to apply it strictly, if there is evidence, and evidence has been shown in this court, that defendant failed to disclose, meaning to say, failed to show his statement or make his statement of assets, liabilities, and unavailable or inaccessible to the public, then he would have committed the impeachable offense. But if he already made, take, took steps to do otherwise, then the whole case falls. What I'm saying is that Article 2 should have said when he failed to disclose, 
and he failed to declare, because declare and disclose are two separate things. As we shall see when we look at the Constitution, Article 11, Section 17, a public officer or employee shall, upon assumption of office, and as often thereafter as may be required by law, submit a declaration under oath of his assets, liabilities, and net worth. Notice, therefore, that the first requirement by the Constitution is to file a declaration. You declare what your assets and liabilities are. And then, in the closing sentence, the Constitution says, the declaration shall be disclosed to the public in the manner provided by law. This is the second requirement, the requirement that it should be disclosed. There are therefore two requirements. First, that he declared. Second, that he disclosed. It appears now that the Chief Justice both declared and disclosed, so the case is closed. But in the spirit of liberality, we have taken note of the explanation of the prosecution of its Article 2 and the Articles of Impeachment. Now, let us look at what our Supreme Court has ruled concerning the filing of the SALN under this constitutional provision. In the 203 case of Francisco versus Nagbamalasaket, etc., Supreme Court said, a determination of what constitutes an impeachable offense is a purely political question. We cannot settle it by citation of authorities or by citation of cases. It is a purely political question, said the Supreme Court. The Constitution enumerates six grounds for impeachment, two of these, namely, other high crimes and betrayal of public trust, elude a precise definition. But the issue calls upon the court to decide a non-justiciable political question, which is beyond the scope of its judicial power. Therefore, we are making history with this particular impeachment case. We are deciding a political question. What are the failures or the omissions in the filing of the sal N that would constitute an impeachable offense? Notice that in the United States Constitution, it is impeachable, it is possible to impeach a high public official for crimes, quote, and for misdemeanors. We did not use the phrase, and for misdemeanors, because misdemeanors in common law systems are mere faults or failures to observe minor ordinances. So our Constitution contemplates a very high crime. We have to see then what is the meaning of a high crime. In the records of the Constitutional Convention, we find at least this sentence. For graft and corruption and betrayal of public trust to be ground for impeachment, their concrete manner of commission must be of the same severity as treason and bribery, offenses that strike at the very heart of the life of the nation. They kept on repeating this clause in the Constitutional Commission, offenses that strike at the very heart of the life of the nation. That is, in pari materia, with all those other obviously high crimes that are enumerated in our Constitution. Our question, therefore, is not about how do you distinguish this value from that value, assessed value, acquisition cost, fair market value. We're not number crunchers. This is a quasi-judicial and quasi-political proceeding. We are, this is not a quasi-accounting proceeding. So the question is whether there is any discrepancy or omission in the son of the defendant, Chief Justice, that strikes at the very heart of the life of the nation. Now I come to a famous or, according to your view, an infamous statement that was made by an American president during the attempt to impeach the most, one of the most famous justices of the U.S. Supreme Court, Justice William Douglas, in April 1970. At that time, Gerald Ford, ultimately president of the U.S., was just a representative, and he maintained this famous, infamous statement. An impeachable offense is whatever a majority of the House, or in our case, one-third of the House, considers it to be at a given moment in history. So we are actually writing the book for what is an impeachable offense. Conviction results from whatever offense or offenses two-thirds of the other body, meaning to say two-thirds of the Senate, just like the Philippine Senate, considers to sufficiently serious to require removal.